not questions. Wake up to reality, reality. Welcome to another episode of Reality Tonic. I am your host, Spencer. We have Rob here, and we have another very special guest here on Reality Tonic, where we get into your reality. He is a tattoo artist, a writer, a artist, like a regular artist, and um, a bunch of other things, and the man has an amazing story. So please welcome Mr. Dan Hank. Is it Hank? Hank. Hank. Welcome, sir. How are you? Yeah. Good to meet you. So you have a very, very, very impressive story. I was just talking to Rob before and he goes, wow. So he does more than just tattoos for sure. I mean, you just doing tattoos in general is fascinating from people like on our side. You know, we already have a bunch of questions on that, but I definitely want to dive deep into your story a little bit as well. So um, first off, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Just, you know, give me a quick 30 seconds. Okay, I wanted to be a comic artist. Uh, I got kicked out of my house at 18, and I still kept the dream alive. I went through a whole string of shitty jobs, eventually put myself through a community college for art. And my art teacher is a really cool guy. He said, if you want a career, you got to move to New York City. So I moved to New York City, interviewed with DC Comics, interviewed with Penguin Books, a bunch of people. It turns out none of those guys really paid much money. Huh. And they started at the bottom of the rung, and I was like, in the meantime, I started tattooing, thinking once I get a more stable, regular job, you know, then I'll quit tattooing and do that. And then I enjoyed tattooing so much that it stuck with that. So when did you realize, like, damn, I'm good? Like, enough to be able to <laughs> be confident to work on people, you know? Well, first of all, I, I think anybody who goes, damn, I fucking awesome, probably isn't. So um, I, I thought that, like, everyone liked my art and, you know, plenty of people were like, hey, you know, do something on me. And initially, when you start out, you do stuff for either free or for very little money just to, like, get your stuff out there. And then people like what you did on someone else. And then they ask you to do something. And once people are asking you to put your artwork on them, then the prices go up. So did you have formal schooling on tattooing or do you have to do that at some point to get a license or? Well, you don't have to do that. Um, and, and it was actually kind of a surprise. I got the New York City license on tattooing. And when I took the class, um, I was a tattoo artist. There was one of the guys tattoo artists. Everyone else, um, there were a lot of people that learned on their own or they, you know, want to do cosmetic tattooing or they, it, they rip um, piercing and tattoos into the same thing. So, like, there was a whole slew of people who basically, they just decided to do it. They had absolutely no training whatsoever. And me and the one other tattoo artist, he's from California, with the only people taking the test. And it's a bloodborne pathogens test. So it's basically to make sure they you know how not to infect people. But it has absolutely nothing to do with your ability to tattoo. Wow. So you don't even need to possess a certain type of artistic skill to be able to do it. Like technically I could go and do it. I learned how to, I mean, I probably wouldn't get hired anywhere, but I, I could call myself a tattoo artist, which is pretty scary. Well, the only thing is, you know, you're not allowed to tattoo out of your house. It, it's actually against the law, even if you have a separate room set up for tattooing. So it has to be out of a shop and any reputable shop is not going to hire you unless you have a portfolio of proven work that you've done. And often, at least in the old school days when I started, they would call all your previous employers and they would call your mentor and they would, you know, check up on you to make sure that you were a solid person. Interesting. All right, cool. Um, I want to rewind a little bit because I know you mentioned you got kicked out of your house when you were 18. Um, Can you tell me about that? Like, what'd you do? It's a, well, I was a teenage punk rocker. I had a blue mohawk, you know, spiky little jacket. Like, I looked like I was in a British punk rock band, basically. Nice. Like, like SLC uh, punks? Like, that kind of look? Or? Yeah. I, I really don't like that movie, but I think a lot of that is because I don't like Matthew Lillard, and he's one of the main guys in it. And I thought it was a very comical approach to something that, you know, as a kid, like, you take whatever you're into seriously. So 
you know, I thought it was kind of disrespecting what it, what, <laughs> yeah. what I took really seriously. But um, yeah, no, I, I looked a lot like that. My dad's um, real conservative, real religious, lifetime military, and uh, we just did not see eye to eye at all. And then he's just like, you got to bounce, or you're you're 18, so everybody starts giving you the shove a little bit, right? Well, one, I looked like that, which, you know, who's embarrassed by the way I look, you know? And then I lived in Virginia, and the cops kept making up stories of, like, like, like for instance, um, I was smoking a cigarette um, right over top of, like, you know, you have those little, like, concrete pathways, you know, between houses, and they have, like, a little tiny bridge over a creek, and, it, like, they're, like, bike paths and stuff like that. So I was on one of those smoking a cigarette. And some neighbor called the police and said, there's a suspicious looking character setting stuff on fire. So they show up, <laughs> throw me against a cop car, search me. I have matches, I have cigarettes. They're like, why do you have so many matches? Because I, like, I fucking smoke. But mm-hmm. took me to jail, press arson charges against me. I did, uh, pay a fine, do community service. But all this stuff piled up. So my dad just saw me as constantly getting in trouble. I'm just an embarrassment to him. And uh, then... I actually did really, really well in school, but uh, I wanted to do art for a living. And he's like, art's not a real career. And so he kicked me out of the house. What was high school like when you, you know, when you're a punk rocker, you're heavily in the scene and stuff. What, what was it? Where, what was it like growing up in high school? What were you perceived as? Well, when I was in, um, I was in Southern Florida when I started high school. You're mil- I had a military family, so every three years we'd move. So when, when we were in Gainesville, Florida, you know, pretty much it was a really bad school. Like what they did is they, they, the people who tested really high, they put them in a really bad school, hoping it would raise like the grades of the entire school. So pretty much as long as you didn't do anything to jack up other people, they were cool with whatever you did. So I moved from that environment to a way more uptight school in Virginia where you know, you, they gave you shit over everything you did. So I was getting like straight A's. I had, you know, high, high um, GP, high everything. And, and they moved me in and they moved me into all these advanced classes. And then one, they didn't like the way I look. Two, they didn't like the fact that I skipped everything and gone into the advanced classes. And Three, they didn't like, you know, I probably had like a really obstinate, over the top personality too, you know, being like a punk rocker in a more conservative area. And uh, yeah, so it, it just, it didn't go well. So I got a lot of shit, even though I did all the assignments and scored really high. So yeah, you get a lot of shit. I mean, being uh, with your family military, traveling all the time, especially when in high school and stuff, relocating, that kind of sucks, right? Yeah. yeah. The pros of it is you can kind of, you know, have a whole new image if you really wanted to and change some certain ways about you. But it sounds like, you know, you're a real dude and you're like, you know what, take me as I am or whatever. Now, were you getting into fights in school or did you find a solid peer group? I did get into fights. Um, I had a solid peer group. So, I mean, they're, they're high school fights. So like, as opposed to it being like rolling around in the dirt fist fights, it's more like war of words, pushing each other, stuff like that. And I was a skinny little punk rocker. So it wasn't like I was like, you know, some jacked up muscular guy. And uh, so I kind of tried to, you know, not get in, you know, big fist fights, big over the top confrontations. But you got you definitely got harassed a lot. And there's definitely a lot of stuff where, like, if you were really outspoken, you got your ass kicked. Um, it was more outside of school there was in school because in school you have we call them narcs like you know, all the school security and stuff and you'd be outside you'd be walking around and you know you look crazy and somebody would drive by the pickup truck and they'd be like hey faggot fuck you and you'd be like oh fuck your mom then like five of them would get out and they beat you up yeah. i had, like my nose broken three times it yeah it, it didn't go well so yeah you're a tough guy i mean you had i, I looked at your uh some of your stuff online too you're a martial artist as well, right? Yeah, I was uh, actually I got my ass kicked so much. Yeah, and I was like, I got to learn how to fight. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's weird. Once you learn how to fight, you actually don't get in that many fights. Right. You know, unless you're an asshole, mm-hmm. and I try not to be an asshole. 
Um, but yeah, I, I took uh, first sister in Taekwondo. I'm a third degree or second black belt in Taekwondo. Then um, I saw the first UFC and I saw um, they had Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And it was like, they were just like, everybody was being shit on by the new styles coming out. So then I branched out. Like now I've taken, um, I'm a blue belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I, it's a, uh, I do Muay Thai. Muay Thai is, uh, they don't really have belts, but um, I'm a black Kerrang, uh, which is, I mean, if they go by anything, that that would be the highest. Um, I did Jeet Kune Do, which is Bruce Lee stuff, but I did everything. I did a lot of wow. stuff. Wow. And so not only do you look like you can kick Rob's ass, you yeah. definitely can kick Rob's ass. Probably. Um, <laughs> for those, if Rob's very scared of you. Again, you're probably, you're probably like the fourth <laughs> guest that we have that he's scared to death of, for sure. No, but, come on. He says this to everybody. No, but this is the guy. I mean, the last guy, Elvis, we had an Elvis uh, tribute artist on. Um, he's yeah. like in his 60s, and Rob was scared to death of him. So, no. I mean, <laughs> you can imagine what he's thinking about you right now. I'm shaking in my slippers. Well, so. did, did the Elvis tribute artist kind of look like Val Kelmer? Like, uh, it, no, <laughs> no, have you seen the movie True Vance? No, no, no. Oh, wait, is that the Elvis? Uh, that's the Elvis movie, yeah, right? yeah, where it's like Elvis, he's speaking to uh, uh, what's the main character's name? Um, the actor Christian Slater. I think John was showing us that, Rob. Yeah. I'm not sure, but I gotta check that out. I gotta check that out. So, you kind of, I mean, you're all over the place. You're an author, right? You write some horror books, you right. do. You know the tattooing. You're a regular. You know you're a so you're a tattoo artist. You're an an artist. Also, you did political comics. I I read. So what kind of political comics were you doing? Was did it did it go from a certain side or was it just all over the place, kind of making fun of everybody? Well, I tend to be more libertarian than anything. So it's pretty much you leave me alone, I leave you alone. You know whatever. And uh, I lived in D.C. Uh, that's kind of a story how we ended up there. But I lived in Virginia. And then my car got wrecked. I moved up with my girlfriend. I lived in D.C. And I was just drawing all the time. Like I did all the artwork for everybody's bands and Pin Blood Jackets and stuff. But I did a political cartoon. And I don't know if you remember when the Republicans did the, the contract with America. It was like uh, Newt Gingrich and Bob Dole, like all the old school people. And they did this whole thing where they, they rushed into office and they're like, we're going to fix everything. And um, I did a cartoon called The Contract on America. And I had the Statue of Liberty and like gun sites and stuff like that. And, and uh, I had like all the major characters playing like uh, movie characters like Newt Gingrich was the mob boss. And um, anyways, so I did this cartoon. I just did it for fun. And somebody showed it to somebody. I don't know how I came on their radar, but there was something called Mad Cat Magazine. They're like, Hey, we love your cartoons. Can you do cartoons for us? So I started doing cartoons for him. And the first one was that one. But then the next one was like attacking, I think, gun control. And, and, you know, so it was like all over the place. So every like I got the most hate mail of any artist in Mad Cat magazine. But also, whenever I did a cartoon, more issues would sell. So. You're get you're generating sales. You work in there. You're causing you know you're stirring up a little controversy. Great. Doing what you love. Are we making money at this point? When yeah. I hear you're writing for a comic, very I'm like, little oh, money. Yeah. Like, All right. You know, like we're writing for you know a magazine. I'm thinking you're doing okay. You said very little, huh? I was washing dishes at a restaurant, and I would get I think like twenty five dollars a cartoon, and I was I wondering how to expand this out to like doing art for a living. So I went to a Society of Illustrators meeting in Baltimore and everybody there was just really down on the industry and complaining about how they weren't getting paid and it wasn't what it used to be and all that sort of stuff. I was like, wow, this uh, this really isn't probably going to be what I thought it would be. So I went kind of back to my um, initial idea, which was being comic artist. And I, I just, you know, I, I work all day as a dishwasher and then go home at an art table and I just play music and I draw and draw for hours. So I was submitting to all these comic companies and I was getting some good feedback from them. Um, there were a couple of kitchen sink press said they wanted to put out my stuff and then they went bankrupt. Um, Paradox Press, which was a black and white version of um, 
DC Comics is like their division that was doing black and white comics. They wanted to put in my stuff. Then I guess that division closed down. So I was like, how, how do I get ahead here? So that's when I decided if I really want to take this seriously, I need to go to art school. So then I went to a community college for art and I like I, I worked part time at two jobs to afford it Went to a community college for art. And then, you know, finally on the advice of my, my art teacher, he said, if you really want a career in art, you got to move to New York City. So that's what I did. I moved to New York City. So going to art school, did you actually learn anything? I feel like if you got it, you got it. And if you don't, you don't. Like if I went to art school, I'd be a mess, right? You have to have some type of skill to thrive. Right. Well, there, there's two things. One, you do definitely need a career or you do definitely need like a, you need something like, like an inspiration. You need something to guide you. But it, it's not just, you know, pure artist steps on the scene to do everything perfect. You know, it really helps to have a guy who, can teach you light and shade, can teach you anatomy, can teach you perspective. And I had I had the luck of having this great teacher. He was like a kind of controversial black artist in DC that taught art in Virginia. And anything I did because he was a controversial artist was cool with him. He would just come and he would like, you know, talk to me about anatomy and stuff like that. And he actually taught me a lot. So all those little basic stuff, it's like, it, it seems like minor stuff, but it makes all the difference. Cool, cool. You mentioned, you know, it sounds like you have some disappointments when it comes to, you know, you're getting the jobs, you're not making much money. I know you you mentioned a big name there, so DC Comics, right? Right. When what's what's big money in the comic world or in the animation world, and what is garbage money? All right. Well, first of all, there's not big money in the comic industry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there are people that I looked up to and they now teach art at a college because and they'll be like in their 60s because they never made enough money to have a retirement, you know, nest egg. Even that. if they were like, hey, I drew Spider-Man issue six. Like, it doesn't mean that guy's oh, yeah, yeah. filthy rich. In fact, there, there's a whole long history of artists being screwed over. Um, probably one of the best stories um, that everyone recognizes, like Alan Moore, who wrote The Watchmen. Like a lot of people know what the Watchman is. So when he wrote Watchmen, you know, he, he was concerned about having the rights to it. And what DC Comics told him is like, well, we have to renew the rights every, I don't know what it was, like every six months or a year or whatever. They're like, you know, but they ask us to renew it. We just won't renew it. But then after Watchmen was hit, they started renewing it all the time. So to this day, he still does not have the rights to the stuff that he wrote. And then they started putting out like Watchmen watches and Watchmen, you know, shirts and Watchmen posters, all this stuff. And he said, where's my percentage of the merchandise? And they go, oh, well, that's advertisement for a comic. We don't have to pay you. So, I mean, I don't, you know, he's definitely not struggling, but one of the biggest names in comic books and he doesn't have nearly what he should, it, it, you know, it, for everybody else, like, you know, they fall way down to the spectrum. You have people that were amazing and they could, you know, barely pay the bills. Wow. So, I mean, are they like, you know, in a regular job, you know, $16 an hour or whatever. It's they give oh, you no. X, oh, X no. amount per thing. Well, like, what do you Here's getting? the thing with, with comics, like, for instance, you know, if you look at a comic book, it's about 24 pages of art and they expect those 24 pages every single month. And they break it down, like one guy's penciler, one guy's anchor, one guy's letter, one guy's colorist, one guy's the author. And one problem I had is they won't let you do more than one job. You can only do one of those jobs. And you're expected to turn at 24 pages a month, every single month. And they don't, I, I, I don't remember what it was at the time when I interviewed with them, like it was in 98, I think it was like 23,000 a year. To live in Brooklyn, which yeah. is not cheap, work your ass off, and you know you only have one job. And the problem is, if you're say the penciler, you might do beautiful pencils, but the inker you get is going to be since you're brand new, he's going to be brand new. He might be horrible, so his inks are ruining your beautiful pencils. You know, maybe the story is horrible because you don't get to write the story. So. Horrible story, maybe horrible anchor, horrible colorist. Although the color is is a little bit more simple, but the thing is, is really really hard to break out of that bubble. You know, I'm I'm sitting here shaking my head because I can't. 
we're not i'm not in that world right so right. like i'm just sitting there looking at a, a, a comic book i'm like oh that's cool skimming through the pages whatever but you have no idea what these people on the other side are going through right like right. my version of petty stuff at work like compare you know the ink guy or doing what like it's just yeah. it's, it's kind of cool to hear i definitely didn't know that that there's so many different people you know like outline middle ink you know color that's so cool to me well i remember when i interviewed with um i interviewed with andrew helfer and he looked at my pencils and um like it, there were fully finished pages i had in this you know very slick portfolio and he goes you know, oh, the, these illustrations are too detailed for most anchors. I was like, oh, I like my own stuff. He's like, oh, no, no, no. You know, and the thing is, you draw it, then it goes to the writer, and the writer might change it. Then he sends it back to you. Then you redraw it for him. Then at some point, it goes to the editor. So the editor has to go over it. So there's a couple eyes, and they might make you redraw stuff a couple different times, you know, before it actually comes out. And Rob... Um, I don't, he, he doesn't have to mention if he doesn't want to the name, but he in the editing world, right? Really yeah. wanted to go to a place where it sounded like it just sounded like a really cool place. It's a network. Rob, say what it is. Who cares? You can what? do that, right? Vice. Vice, right? I thought it sounded really cool. It but looks it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Vice, look, Vice looks crazy. Go ahead, Rob. Tell yeah. him what happened. Well, yeah, I'm a video editor. That's what I do for work. I mostly do in like advertising, but um. I looked into Vice because I'm like, man, they make such cool shit. And like, I'd love to work there, or just check it out or something. But they make like dirt money, at least what I could find out, like the editors and stuff. If you had to start as like an assistant editor and it's in like Brooklyn, New York or, you know, where, you know, so it's like you It'd wouldn't be, be able to survive. Yeah, just you'd be broke. I mean, rent's pretty expensive in New York City. So what I've noticed is a lot of people that actually make money off it like mike mignola who did hellboy and frank miller who did the dark knight returns mm. and stuff like that they get a movie deal and they actually get real money when hollywood picks up their stuff until then they make nothing mm. so it's just to say you have a cool job you know what i mean like oh yeah i work for here like i do Frank this. miller was talking about and he was saying like he lived in harlem when harlem was really bad and he worked for DC Comics, and he could barely make enough money to pay his rent. He just loved comics so much he did it. Wow. That's so point, cool. he kind of lucked out, and that's how he made his career. All I right. was curious, when you interview for a comic, do you bring, like, your own illustrations and stories, or do you, like, mimic, like, Spider-Man or, you know, whoever DC has, like, when you show up for well, the kind of It kind of depends, yeah. Okay. Um, there are some places like uh, Image Comics and uh, mainly Image Comics, but I think um, like Marvel Comics a little bit like this too. Um, but they want to see their stuff. Yeah. So if you did, if you apply to Image Comics and you do any different characters, they say, "Hey, can you do something with our characters?" So they don't want to see any original ideas. Like Image Comics is kind of like top tier talent that went to image comics like Tom McFarlane, he didn't spawn and stuff like that. So they already had kind of their market and they're just looking for people to help them push their products. But if you go to DC, DC is a little bit more open. At least they used to be like they did um, Hellblazer and Swamp Thing and all these kind of like, you know, off the bat ideas. And so that's actually why I applied to them. I thought, yeah, the, that'll be perfect. You know, they, they have something called the Vertigo line, which is like the line that put out Sandman and they put out, you know, Swamp Thing and they put out all this stuff that was like a little bit off center. And I figured if you went to them with a good idea, they'd be open to it. But not really. That wasn't my experience. Hmm. Rob, what? you want to get into the juicy stuff for a second? Sure, I guess. Hey, Dan. Okay. Tell me when you get stabbed by a crackhead. Because <laughs> that's what I read. <laughs> well, I lived in D.C. And uh, my girlfriend had a sister from the suburbs. They moved in with us in D.C. And in D.C., this is the Marion Barry year. So it was really bad. Just the murder capital of the U.S. And so you live in like a mediocre area and there would be like a gated fence around your community. Not because you lived in some bougie upscale place but because you needed that so you didn't die, you know? And, but she moved in from the suburbs, so she decides to take her fluffy white dog out for a walk at like 12 o'clock at night. So as she's walking around, 
a crackhead, well, two crackheads came up to her and one of them acted like he had a gun in his pocket and the other one acted like he had a knife and, you know, they're trying to, trying to rob her. She's like, I don't have any money on me to go. Oh, but you know, your money in there, they pointed the place. They made her key in to come to the place. So she came into the place. Um, one of them got scared and he ran off, but the one who acted like he had a gun actually didn't have anything. But once he got inside with her, you know, he stopped acting like he had a gun because they had an open toolbox. He ran over, grabbed a hammer. So he was holding her head and like with the hammer next to her head, like he's going to bash your brains out. And then she screams up to us. First, she called up to us, like me and my girlfriend were upstairs. Then she calls up sounding hysterical. So I'm like, what the fuck is going on? So I come down the steps. As I come down the steps, the crackhead has her like this. And like his eyes, like they're like, like that pale yellow color and like rolled like, back like in the chair. Yeah. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. And, and I'm like, hey man, what do you want? What do you want? And he can't even talk to me like normal. He's like, I wanted money. He's <laughs> and there's scary like a looking. pause in between. Yeah. I'm like, I'm like, she don't have any man. He's like, but you do. I'm like, I just got shaved, man. And I'm like emptying my pockets. And he edges over with her and he's like Give me what you got. Like, I guess he didn't trust me. And you know, he's trying to slap my pockets. And this is DC. DC is pretty bad. So I have a knife that I'd wear all the time. Nice. So I that probably saved my life. Uh, I don't know how many times. But so I had this big knife, and they have kind of rules. It's like you have to have the knife in the sheath. It can't be like on display. It can't be shorter than your hand. You know, it, it has to be visible, whatever. So the crack has, you know, he's like trying to pat my pockets and he sees the knife and he goes for the knife. So wait, when he's patting your pockets, where's his knife right now? No, he, he doesn't have a knife. Yeah, I have no a knife. knife and he oh, has he had knife. that thing. He had that. Okay, yeah, he had some. So, other, okay. So then when he's patting, and he's patting with the hand that's not holding the hammer, and then when he reaches the knife, he starts to go for the knife. I was like, I'm not letting a fucking crackhead get a knife. So I'm trying to grab the knife, and he tries to hit me with the hammer, and I grab his hand with the hammer, and I'm smashing his hand against the wall. And eventually he like let go of the hammer, but like we're fighting back and forth with the knife and he has like these spurts of energy, then he'll lose energy. The spurts of energy. So he'll start to get the knife. Then, then I start to get that. He starts to get it. Then I started. And meanwhile, he's like trying to like angle it around and stab me in the stomach with it. That's crazy. And, so and scary. eventually he saw through my thumb all the way to the bone. Like he, he severed the tendon. Oh man. Whoa. And, <laughs> See, and my my girl, you know, she comes running down the steps, and we have the heavy end of a pool cue. She's like cracking him in the head with it. There's no wait. There's no drugs involved on your guys' end. You're just like you no. just hear something. You go down. This sounds like a mess right now. Please yeah. keep going. Go ahead. Well, she's cracking him with with a pool cue. She cracks him. It's just a heavy end of a pool cue. She cracks him seven times, and finally, on the seventh time, he looks at her like, "Bitch, I'm going to kill you." So she runs upstairs and she calls down one. There was a police station a block away. So she calls them. They're like, if you don't calm down, we're going to hang up. She's like, no, no, my boyfriend, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, crackheads attacking him. And they're like, yeah, all right, we'll send somebody over. 45 minutes later, they call from across the street, like after the guy's already gone. But she calls them. Then you know, she comes and she's just watching it. Like it goes back and forth and back and forth. I finally get the knife and I, I turn to like stab him and he runs. And I'm wearing like these, uh, they're like kind of Harley Davidson, like, you know, knee high boots. And it, I have um like metal, uh, uh, what do you call them? Uh, metal toes and like metal heel. Yeah, complete and, badass uh, looking. Time, I'm like kicking him as hard as I can to the shins. <laughs> I'm sure the next day he could barely walk. But at the time he's like, high on crack so you know it, it didn't seem to be affecting him at all but i finally get the knife and and, and the minute i got the knife i could see his eyes got really big and he turns around <laughs> and he just starts running <laughs> i'm chasing him but i'm wearing these giant boots so obviously you know <laughs> crackhead is faster than i am and he makes it away wait do you have a mohawk at this point too like tell me what do you what do you dress like when this is happening uh, i had a mo i had a black mohawk uh I mean, I looked very punk rock, you know, yeah. I, I had like a band t-shirt. I, I had leather pants. 
you know, nice. and, and I had these giant boots. And this is blood. Is there? There must be blood everywhere, right, on your hand. Well, actually, it didn't bleed everywhere because it, it like is a pretty clean cut. It cut all the way through to the bone. Oh. And I remember when the the cops came and they called from across the street and were like, "No, he's not here." And they came in. And the guy's like, he has a notepad. He flips it open. And you could see he really could care less. He's like. All right, so what do you look like? I was like, I don't know, he's a fucking crackhead, you know, with a puffy orange jacket. <laughs> yeah, and, crackhead, and, puffy orange jacket, obviously. Yeah. Right? <laughs> you know, but and he's like, yeah, that cut looks pretty deep. And I was like, yeah, I'm fine. He's like, should I call you uh, like an ambulance? I'm like, I'm like, no, I'm fine. He's like, like I can see him laughing. He's like, ah, move your finger. And I try and I can't. That's when I realize my te- my tendon is severed. Damn. And I'm trying to move my thumb. And he's like, see, I told you. Ha ha. <laughs> so I took a cab to the to George Washington had um George Washington University had like a, a place nearby that was like a it's not a full-on hospital, but it's like more like a clinic. So I went there to get my thumb sewn up, which is another story because actually they just sew it up. They didn't actually do any surgery or anything and i'm like talking to them i'm like don't i need surgery and they laugh at me you know and they're like no they're like yeah probably do you have insurance i was like no like, i'm a 19 year old punk rock kid you know and then i'm like can you put me on a payment plan they're like they laugh at me again they're like oh no and i'm like isn't there a community hospital around here somewhere <laughs> they laugh at you again and wow. there was one community hospital that was in Southeast DC, right next to the jail, which is like Southeast is the worst part of DC. And uh, so I got surgery there and they totally botched that by the way, but that's another story. But you can wow. still move your fingers, right? Uh, mostly. Fortunately, that's not my drawing hand. I was All gonna right, say, go. is, that, is that your like tattooing or drawing yeah. hand, you know? Yeah. Wow, that's some crazy stuff, man. That was, um, that was wild. I, I did mention at the beginning. Oh, and by the way, I do want to mention real quick. I always, you can ask Rob, you can ask my wife. I all, I, any opportunity I could have to be a hero. I, I want it so bad. <laughs> I want a traumatic event like that to happen. But in my head, I'm beating the shit out of this dude, right? Like I just win. Hey, you call 911. You get the AED while I have this guy choked out doing all that. But in reality, what would happen? What happened to you? Would happen to me? I'd end up just like kicking the shit out of the guy's sh- shins, and uh, and I'm somehow end away. up getting stabbed. He's looking like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? But like, it's crazy. So I mean, it's a very realistic story. I appreciate it. If I told the story, I would end up. You, I beat the guy's ass, no problem. You know, like, <laughs> but that's in my reality. My, in my that's my reality. Well, right? I am so. an author, so I could probably make up a story like that. Right. So what I did. So what I. <laughs> Let's tie into Let's go into that now. When did you become an author? So right now we know you like drawing, right? You're trying that route. Then you got into tattooing a little bit. You touched on that. Let's talk about being an author. Cause again, that's something that sounds so cool. Sounds smart. Also sounds successful, right? Yeah. But is there any money in being an author at, I guess at your level? No, probably not. Um, I make some money, but not that much money. Um, but it, it's again, it's a matter of trying to get your stuff out there. And uh, like the thing that I made good, consistent money off of is tattooing. Mm-hmm. Um, we, I got into it, you know, first to make consistent money. Um, but mm-hmm. when I was in high school, like I couldn't determine whether I wanted or I couldn't decide whether I wanted to be uh, an author or an artist because I enjoyed both. And then I remember I read right around the same time Watchmen and Dark Knight. I was like, Oh, I can do both. This is great. I'll illustrate my stories. You know, it, it could fill all the niches. And then that's what part of why it was such a disappointment in interview with DC Comics, and they don't let you do that. And what I finally settled on is I write stories, but I do illustrations in them. Like if you've seen old school, like pulp magazine and stuff, they'll have like a couple of illustrations. I'll do larger, like almost full scale, you know, they call them in comics splash pages, where it's like one, the whole page is one giant illustration. So I like I'll those. do like nine of those or whatever in, in a book. Originally, I was going to do more, but they take forever to do. You know, so I do about nine per book, and then I paint the cover, 
And uh, I, I'm happy with that because I get to write and illustrate my story. That's awesome. So you wrote how many books you got published right now? Three. I have three full novels. I have two chapbooks. Chapbooks are like short stories, kind of published. Like um, they, they're they're published in paperback. They're signed and numbered. And I also have some short stories as well. See, but like, man, I want to be you. I'm jealous of you. <laughs> I like that horror stuff. I don't really watch the movies and things like that, but I love haunted houses. I love that whole. I love that whole thing. Right now, I can't go to Universal by myself and go to Halloween Horror Night because my wife thinks that's weird. I don't think it's weird, but I want to be able to do that. So it sounds like you you love that horror stuff too, huh? I do, but I, I'll say two things. One about Universal, like. I did a tattoo convention nearby and then me and all my tattoo friends went there. And it's funny because a lot of the kids who were dressed up as like, you know, leather face or whatever, they were more scared of us. Uh, <laughs> so it wasn't scary. No, not really. Cause they, they come up to you and then like they pause, like they got all nervous. Like we're all tattooed up. It's like, we're yeah. not <laughs> bad people, you know? No, you yeah. definitely look scary. You look like, I mean, the tattoo on the face, right? You just, so folks at home, I mean, it's just an abundance of tattoos, I think, on his neck. And then I see one on his, what is that, your right eyebrow? Uh, I have my whole head tattoo. <laughs> oh, wow. Man, nice. Check that out. <laughs> what is that? Please describe what is on that beautiful bald head. It's, uh, well, it's biomechanics. It's like flesh and machinery, mixing it mainly machinery, kind of like a, like a Terminator or a cyborg sort of thing. Damn, um, badass. Yeah. Thank you. I was curious. I had, uh, I had brain cancer and I went through I yeah. went through chemotherapy and radiation. So my hair doesn't grow in certain spots. So I have a really weird fucking haircut. And I was like, you know, I'll just shave my head and get my head tattooed. Hey Rob, did you catch what he said there? Yeah, that was he like, had he just... brain cancer. Yeah. So right <laughs> now, you know, in some people's worlds, the most traumatic thing they have in their life is I was kicked out of my house when I was 18, right? This dude got stabbed. Okay. Yeah. He, I mean, there's another traumatic thing in his life that maybe we'll bring up, but he got stabbed. He has, he had brain cancer, Rob. You know what that Crazy. is? Crazy. Um, that shit will kill you. That shit is dangerous. Tell us what happened. Well, I moved to New York. Um, I just, you know, I was about two years into my tattooing career. So I had just started, but I was, that's still early in tattooing. And uh, I just started to get like some stability, like this is what I'm going to do. And uh, then I started getting headaches. And at the time, like, since I'd only been tattooing such a short amount of time, I couldn't afford to go to, like, some expensive clinic. So I went to a local um, Spanish clinic. You know, they said, oh, you have migraines. Uh, we'll give you medicine. We have free samples. Oh, no, we don't. They wrote me a prescription, and I went to the pharmacy. And they couldn't read the prescription. And they said, you know, they tried to call the doctor. They couldn't get him on the phone. They said, you got to go to a better place. I went to a better clinic, paid a lot more money. They said, oh, you're dehydrated. They pumped me full of sodium solution. They're like, you know, if you don't feel better tomorrow, give us a call. And the next day, I felt like I had a jackhammer to the back of my head. I felt horrible. Um, my girlfriend was there. We'd had Chinese food the day before. So that morning, I was like throwing up the Chinese food. I was like leaning over like the bathroom sink, like, I felt like putting a gun in my mouth and just ending it. It was, it was so bad. bad. Okay. Yeah. Wow. And uh, she was like constantly calling the clinic. And when they finally came in, they're like, go to the hospital. So we went to Bellevue hospital and I couldn't even walk straight going to the hospital. I was like walking sideways. I was trying to walk straight. I kept going sideways. She kept correcting me. They get me in there. They go, um, what's going on? They're like, what do you do? I was like, Muay Thai. They're like, oh, it's probably a blame breed. Um, they put me in the <laughs> chest. It's a little brain bleed, nothing crazy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they put me in a CAT scan. They go, oh, wait, it's cancer. Oh. Just like that. Like, they, yeah. didn't, they weren't like, hey, you know, can we talk to you, you know? No, they, they're pretty much, they're pretty much, they have no time for that. There was no yeah. nicety involved, yeah. you know? It was like, yeah, you know, you have brain cancer. We have to operate on you right away. Um, apparently, it was a slow-growing tumor, but the inside was all necrotic tissue. It's about the size of a golf ball. And they said, once it burst open, you'd be dead. Right. So, it's like an aneurysm, right? Is that what yeah, it is? They, they said, well, I don't, I don't, I mean, 
interesting. Um, like something breaks in you, something pops open, right? Right, right, right. It, it's a little bit different, but uh, it, I, I don't know all the medical specificity. Right. Me neither. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. They said you probably had about two weeks. Wow. You got two weeks of no, what? They said I probably had, like, if I hadn't come in, I'd oh, be okay. dead. Okay. You know, wow. They said, okay, we're going to do brain surgery. Because it's brain surgery, you know, your chances are about 50 50. So, wait, you go in from, hey, man, I'm, I'm walking, I'm feeling weird. You go to the hospital, they bring you in, they do that thing, the CAT scan. And they're like, hey, you got, <laughs> you got cancer. Oh, and by the way, we need to do surgery right now. Are you like, Oh, okay. Like, what are you saying? Like, what do you say to them? What's going on in your head? As soon as they say, hey, it's cancer. I mean, I, I figured it was something that serious because the the pain was so bad that they give you medication to take it away right before they give you a CAT scan. And once they identified it, I was like, at least they know what it is because this is, this is horrible. Wow. Damn. That's crazy. So, All right, so you- I felt a little relieved. Like my girl, she started crying. She's like, "You don't care." I was like, "Of course I care, but what am I gonna do?" <laughs> right. I don't know. Yeah. I I don't know what reaction I would have. Yeah. I don't know. Because you're gonna be bawling. Like it's either you're crying or you're just like what you are. Like I don't know. Yeah. I just gotta get this done. I guess. So you get the surgery. What's the recovery time on something like that? The uh, recovery is longer than I thought it was. Uh, well, first, they, they told me the surgery is about 50, 50. I call my parents. They say, oh, yeah, let's get into that. Holy shit. Sorry. <laughs> so they say, hey, 50, 50. Right. And I call them and I tell them, and they go, well, you know, last minute plane tickets are kind of expensive or we come see you. <laughs> so so wow. uh, they they definitely didn't come see me. And I had surgery. And uh, unless we're living in the Matrix, you know, I am alive. Um, but they give you about a month after that. They run a pathology on it to see if it's benign or, or uh, malignant. If it's malignant, it's cancer, you know. And they have to, they, they, they told me if they do radiation alone, um, it depends on the stats, but it's anywhere between 60 to 80% effective. If they do chemo alone, it's 40 to 60% effective. If they do the two together, it's 95% effective. I was like, I'll do the two together. So you just went all in, huh? Well, I mean, it, it's like I had an aunt who um, a lot of people, they skip chemo. Like they do the they they do the radiation first and they hope that I'll kill because it it's a lot less brutal. And she did that and then it came back. Well, when it comes back, then they do the chemo, but the chemo is even less effective than it was the first time because the the strongest form of the cancer is actually what survived the radiation. And now you have the weakest way to fight it, which would be the chemo. Damn. So I was like, I'll just do the two together and hopefully overwhelm it. And, you know, that will get rid of it. So at what point did they say to you, you're cancer free? Like as soon as they took that thing out? No, well, they, they take it out. Like I said, they run a pathology on it to see if it's benign or malignant. Uh, the the pathology said it's definitely malignant, and they, they told me the stats, and I was like, I'll do the two together. So they give you a month off, and then they start. And first they do is thirty eight sessions of radiation, and they take weekends off. So it's like you you do it five days in a row, and then you know the radiation isn't that bad. Um, I had brain cancer, which means it's in inside like the you have like a, a blood brain barrier. So it's like along the spine, it's in the brain, it's not in the body. So they're irradiating that area. And when it's the brain, you're okay. When it's the body, it goes through your stomach and it makes you nauseous, but they give you pills and that you're you're all right with that. So if you go through the radiation, it, it's not a, a hugely traumatic experience. The chemo sucks. Chemo That's what I heard. Horrible. They can't figure out something else besides isn't chemo just like a poison in you and you it just like kills exactly off. what they told me. They said it's poison. Hopefully it kills the cancer or not you. Right. Wow. That's what in and, and, and the whole time you're losing your hair, you're puking, you're pooping, and it's like they can't give you something to like not have you lose your hair, maybe. But it's the whole idea of just well, just throw everything under the kitchen sink, as they say, you just throw it at it, and uh hopefully it kills off the cancer. So what was what were you puking and pooping and stuff the whole time? Well, it's two forms of chemo. It's uh you have 
one form that attacks here are red blood cells, which gives the oxygen. So I lived on a seventh floor of Walkman in Brooklyn. So I'd walk up a flight of stairs, stop, have to catch my breath, walk up another flight of stairs, stop, you know. And then that's two weeks. And then you go to a different one that attacks your white blood cells. And the white blood cells are what prevents you from getting really sick when you get a cold or, you know, anything like that. So I remember I, I got a cold and by that night I had 105 degree temperature and I was refusing to go to the hospital. And so my girl was stuffing me in the tub and pouring ice cubes on top of me, trying to get my temperature down. Wow. So that alone, I mean, that, that just sucks. <laughs> so I'm happy you're okay. I mean, you're cancer free. You're feeling Thank good. You. Is there a part of you that's like, uh, like, I like, do you feel cancer free? Like, are you confident it's all set and everything? Or is there something lingering that's like, it might come back? Well, it, I mean, hopefully it won't come back. Um, yeah. but you do have things that linger. Um, those things actually that linger are more from the surgery than from the chemo. Like, I'm half deaf in one ear, like, I have constant ringing in one ear. Oh, um, sounds awful. No pun intended. Uh, but but you you have certain things that like stick with you like like um this radiation I have like you know parts of, of my scalp that just won't grow hair like like patches that just won't grow because they irradiated and it killed all the hair follicles you know so yeah there there's some link oh I have uh, serious memory issues like now it's not nearly as bad but I remember when I first um. I got the surgery. I was still undergoing chemo. Um, by the way, the whole time I was doing chemo uh, and radiation, I was still tattooing. I, I was tattooing. Oh my less, God, but- dude, I was going to ask, like, if you lost your job, because you said it was at the beginning. You were just getting started with the tattoo career. Right. right? Yeah. And, and I was like, and in the old school days, it was pretty hard to get a tattooing job. So I was like, I'm not going to give up on this. Now that I'm finally getting somewhere with this, I'm not going to give up on it. I was going to the gym too. I, I, I went down to three days a week, but I lived in Brooklyn and I'd bike over the Williamsburg bridge. I have to stop on the bridge and puke over the side and then keep biking. Wow. <sighs> aye, aye, aye. And I mean, Rob complains yeah. about everything. <laughs> and oh, come on. You have no idea, you know? <laughs> When I have to drink out of Rob, right? Yeah, we have to pick on Rob. We have to. We have to. You and I are the same, Dan. You know, he he's not built like you and I. So, you know, Um, (laughs) what? All I know is, while all of that is bad, all of it is horrible. You went through another traumatic thing, right? Right. Well, I went through a couple ones uh, because I was also in a car that rolled, and I woke up in the woods. my my wife died and hit a run. That's the one I'm talking about. Yeah. So oh, can awful. you talk about that for a second, or is that like too heavy? No, I, I can talk about that. Um, I was at home. I got a call at like nine in the morning, and it was a police officer was like, "Hey, are you married to Monica Hank, which is my wife's name?" I was like, immediately, I you know, was fully awake. I was like, "Yeah, what's going?" On? They're like, they're totally trying to brush off. They're like. I don't know. She like ran a stop sign or something. It was like, it was like, what? Like she was on a motorcycle going to art school and somebody just plowed in her and kept going. Oh Oh my God. It turns out that apparently in New York, if it's a motorcyclist as opposed to, you know, a car driver or a truck driver. And I don't know that there's, there's something about like it's less paperwork. You can blame it on them. And they were just trying to shuffle it under the rug. They were trying not to do anything about it. And uh, what happened is, you know, her brother, um, my brother-in-law is, uh, they're both immigrants from Columbia. So he speaks Spanish. So he went to all the Columbia, all, all the Spanish speaking news agencies like Telemundo and Univision. And I went to all the English ones like, uh, you know, News 1 and News 5. And we just talk about how horribly we're being treated. And we got some advice from a, We got a lawyer and we got some advice. She's like, pitch her as a model. So she did some like alternative modeling. She's all tattooed up. But once you pitch her as a model, they take it way more seriously. If you say just, oh, it's another tattoo artist, they really don't care. But, you know, she's a young, cute girl. She's all tattooed up. 
Um, we got some of her modeling photos. We said, this is who got hit. And then all of a sudden, everyone's interested. Really? And, yeah. And the thing is, the whole tattoo community and the whole biker community, because she was on a motorcycle when it happened, they got hugely involved in it. And once they got hugely involved in it, it made, like, the New York Police Department look really bad. Like, they apologized to being in person. The, the hospital that she was at, they were treating us horribly. So, of course, we told the news agencies how horribly they were treating us. The president of the hospital came and apologized to me. So, yeah, it was, oh. a, it was a bit of an ordeal. Dude, so so sorry for your loss. Yeah, Time frame-wise, did all this happen? Like, I mean, we go from getting kicked out of your house to... I'm sure we skipped a bunch of stuff, right? I mean, about the wild <laughs> things that happened to you. But you having, you know, you're getting the ball rolling in the tattoo game, you're doing all that stuff, and then, you know, you get stabbed, right? That's that didn't. I don't think that really hindered you too much, right? But you had to heal, you had to do those things, yeah. and then, oh yeah, we'll throw in some brain cancer in there, right? That happens, and then after that, your wife passed away. Yes. So that's a hell of a timeline. Yeah, that's. And a, how old are you? Rough. <laughs> I, I'm 48 right now. Damn, you look pretty damn good, dude. Oh, thank you. Yeah, 48. Sure. Wow. So you've gone through a lifetime worth of just garbage. And uh, but sounds like you're doing really good. It sounds like you're doing well, everything you. you love. I mean, is that safe to say you this this is it? You're you're very happy. I, I am doing what I enjoy. Mm. And, and when I got into tattooing, it was like I'll just make money doing this, you know, until I get a job like doing art or you know, writing books. And actually, I really enjoyed it. I, I I travel all around the world, all all around, you know, doing uh, conventions and guest spots all around the country. I've been in hundreds of books and magazines. It, it's worked out really well. That's awesome. What is the craziest place you've tattooed somebody? The craziest place I've tattooed somebody? Yeah. Um, I don't know. There's some stuff that I've turned down. Like there's a tattoo celebrity like you know these guys get their whole body tattooed yeah so, and they tend to be a little bit off i mean anybody that would get their entire body the whole face everything tattooed is this the black the the black um you know that thing on instagram the black something society or whatever these guys no, are just no, no, yeah yeah there. but not that yeah it's not i mean, there there's a bunch of them there's one guy that's covered in puzzle pieces he's called the mm. enigma there's another guy that like got a bunch of garbage tattoos, then got them all blacked out, and then is getting the white tattoo patterns tattooed over the black. But you have a bunch of people that are kind of like that. And there was one guy who's a tattoo celebrity, and he said the only thing that he didn't have tattooed was his taint. And, <laughs> <laughs> and could I tattoo it? I was like, uh, no. Yeah, that's that's a tender area, you oh. know. Like, oh boy! Well, not only that, but he wants me to do it for free too. Oh, he, he <laughs> that's that's a, that'd be me, right? It's like it's like I wouldn't even do it if you paid me to do it. Yeah, I'm definitely not gonna do it for free. It's yeah, it's supposed to be an honor for you to be stuck, <laughs> stuck between, you know. That's, that's pretty much how it's like. Oh, oh man, you know, you tattooed me. I'm I'm a big deal. It's like nobody fucking knows who these people are. Yeah. yeah, I'm trying to think of who would be a big enough deal for me to tattoo their taint. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I can't you're think. You're gonna forever be known as the yeah. guy who tattoos somebody's taint. Right. Yeah. Right. Like, oh, like, I know that guy. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you never mind what else you do in your life. <laughs> that's what makes you. Oh, that's so crazy. Yeah. Well, all right. It sounds like a good decision that you made on your part. So that's cool. Um, <laughs> but like, the girls come in. Like you, you tattoo the private areas of females and stuff. Like. Well, you tattoo, Bum -bums and you all tattoo that whatever what? you're asked to tattoo. Um, more more often than not, you know, it, it's uh, an area that's not, well, or it's changed. The way it was when I started tattooing is people wanted non-visible tattoos, usually on the smaller side. Now people want, you know, full sleeves, full back pieces. You know, there, there's a joke. Um Having Nick tattoo used to say, stay away from me. I'm dangerous. Now it says, let me read you my vegan poetry. You know, so yeah. it, the, the perspective has changed quite a bit. And what people want, it used to be that every tattoo shop had flash on the walls, like images on the walls. You say, I want this or I want that. You know, what are you going to charge me? And we actually had a price. We're like, 
well, if you get it on your arm, it's an A tattoo. If you get it on like your lower back, it's a B tattoo. You know, we have letters with different prices. That didn't happen anymore. Like the most when people aren't determined, like they haven't decided what they want, they come in, you know, and they show images on Instagram. But a lot of people have seen all the tattoo shows like, you know, Ink Master and stuff like that. And they feel like they have to have some great idea behind it, some great inspiration, which is kind of a blessing and a curse. Yeah. I was going to say, do you feel like that shift in mentality has made like, like tattooing more profitable than when it was like, okay, I got to keep it below my t-shirt sleeves, you know, got to hide it kind of. It, it's a mixed bag. I mean, yeah. it, it, it has and it hasn't. You have more talent out there than you've ever had. Like you have people that go to art school, get out of art school and immediately start tattooing. And that never used to happen. I remember when I started, people were like, oh, you're just a frustrated artist. You know, <laughs> and, and they used to make this big deal about, Tattoo artists and tattooers. Tattooers had like, you know, they're technicians with the trade, like car mechanics. And the artists were like pretentious people who thought they were doing something worthwhile. And uh, that didn't really happen anymore. Everybody kind of struggles to be an artist now. Like I, I remember, you know, coming from school, from art school, I had a portfolio with all my paintings in it. And they're like, oh, you're just a frustrated painter. And now a lot of tattoo artists are like, oh, I paint too. So everybody kind of wants to do that. So the thing is, you know, you have some people that are charging insane fees, you know, but then you have people that, you know, work out of their house and bought a kid off eBay and they'll, they'll do that tattoo for almost no money. And you have people that come to your shop. Like I remember I worked in a shop in downtown New York and I think our minimum at the time was $50 and most tattoos, it could be more than $50. So they come in and they say, you know, hey, how much is that? You say $80. Well, I can get that for $35 in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. We're like, well, go to the Bronx and get it then. Right. Oh, but I like your work better. I'm like, well, then you got to pay for it. <laughs> so when you're doing that, because um, I want to, I know you're a shop owner, right? Yeah. So take me through the experience of being, um, you know, you're working there, you're working at the shop. Is mm -hmm. it similar to a barber shop where like, you know, you're cutting hair and then you pay, you know, to, to have that chair, you have to pay rent, whatever. Like, does a tattoo artist get, if I give my tattoo guy $80 for the tattoo, does he get the full $80? No. It, if you work in our shop, everybody that works at our shop is an independent contractor. So based on what the clientele is and, you know, how good they are and all that stuff, we give them a percentage. So, you know, the percentage varies from artist to artist. Like the absolute minimum bottom of the barrel is usually about 50%. But when they come in, especially if, if they're bottom of the barrel, 50%, most of their supplies, we provide for them for free anyways. And we give them a lot of clientele. Like people will contact the shop and will say, hey, you know, I don't know, Steve. Hey, Steve, we have a tattoo. You want to talk to this guy? So we're feeding them work consistently. And as they get better and they develop a clientele, then you know their percentage rises. Oh, okay. Now, when when you give the tip, that goes to them. Oh yeah. All right. Yeah. So that's why it's I important. Mean, to... You probably have some shady shops that like you know you're supposed to include that. But we don't do that. All right. Cool. Cool. All right. So yeah, it's is it hard run, running a bit? Like, are people walking? Do you get majority of people just doing a walk in and like, hey, I want a tattoo. I want this versus like a plan well, appointment well, and stuff. Have different shops i mean we're we're more of um i wouldn't say we're appointment only but you know you can't just walk in and get a tattoo most of the time like you know you can call you can come in you can talk to somebody and you know you might get an appointment a week later but you know it, it's not that's one of the problems with all those shows like Ingbaster. Like people think they can walk in and get a full back piece and you're just drawn on the spot and start on them. And anybody who's good enough to do a back piece, you know, that, that anyone says, you know, is worthwhile. Those people are going to be booked up. You're not going to be able to walk in and, and anybody that can draw it on the spot is probably not that good of an artist. Like, if I draw up a back piece, I mean, it probably takes me about four or five hours to draw it. Mm -hmm. 
So how do you determine who's a good artist versus a bad artist? Like, I know you mentioned, you know, if they're if they're bringing in clientele and stuff like that, you know, like when somebody comes in, how do you evaluate their work? Do you, is it like, I know, Rob, what do you guys, you guys have reels, right? Like just examples yeah. of what you do now. Does somebody come in and say, hey, here's my artwork? Or do you say like, all right, you get the chair for a little bit and then you oversee they bring, them? They, they do bring in a portfolio so we can see their work, but we never hire anybody straight off the bat. We're like, Okay, we like your work. Why don't you do one day here as a guest spot and we'll see. We'll see if we get along with you. And then you kind of, you know, they'll be working on a tattoo. You stop by, hey man, what are you working on? And, and we'll just we'll see. Because it's not just whether they're good, are they also sociable? Mm -hmm. Can you deal with them? They might be the greatest thing in the world, but they might be horrible to deal with. And we we've had people like that. Mm. Did anybody wow. ever like come in and said like oh i'm a tattoo artist but they were just lying you know or anything no like that. um if we haven't heard because it's actually in a way a little bit of a small community and then everybody knows everybody else so you talk to me we're like well what shops have you worked at who have you worked for um you look at their artwork you tend to like those shops you tend I tend to know the people that run those shops or know people that work to those shops. And so you can call people and you kind of do a little bit of checking on them, but the, the ultimate test is when they come in and they do a guest spot and we don't feed them anything. It's like you bring your own guy in here, you do a tattoo so we can watch you do it. And then if we think you're good enough, you know, then we'll keep you. And not to be a dick about it, but people have to prove their worth for sure for sure i mean it's your name on that building right so yeah. wow um yeah man just crazy crazy so yeah. you're doing all of these things what's the end game ultimately you could snap your fingers tomorrow everything works out the way it's supposed to what's well, our vision i i really i really enjoy writing i enjoy doing artwork i enjoy tattooing so the end game i guess would just be for it to all run smoothly and nothing to interrupt me doing stuff. Like you, you always have like little stuff that falls, that, that falls out of place. Like, Hey man, I was supposed to get tattooed by you, but I have 50 different ideas and I want to discuss with you about why they're all way better than what I talked to you earlier that you spent six hours drawing up. You know, you get that, you know, you, you, with, with our work, maybe uh, I'll do like, you know, a painted cover for a book or, you know, for a magazine. They'll be like, yeah, but can you do more like this? And you're like, I just spent 60 hours doing an oil painting and now you want me to change it. But so, yeah, you know, you, you have like little hiccups along the way. But if everything runs smoothly the majority of the time, then I think you're doing pretty good. So. Has anybody ever come in and said, dude, you know, I was thinking about it. I don't like this tattoo. Like once they, once they already got it, like what's the, I mean, oh, once yeah. it's on, yeah, it's yeah. on. So what do you do? I've been tattooed in 20 years. So it, it pretty much like every line of experience, she, like you have some people that they have a legitimate gripe, you know, like, Hey, you know, I had a great idea. You did not execute it. Well, you have some people that, you know, they can't sit worth a shit. So you'd be tattooing and they'll be jerking everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, your lines don't look smooth because you're jerking everywhere is, you know, imagine drawing a line on a piece of paper and somebody keeps jerking the piece of paper, you know, and then somehow that's your fault, you know, that, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. and then you have to deal with that. And then you have some people that they'll get something and they'll change their mind. Like, I remember I did a, a guest spot years and years ago and I did a portrait of Leatherface on a guy. And then he gets a hold of me like six months later and he goes, yeah, I'm not really into horror or Leatherface. I just got it because, you know, you're the horror guy and you're coming here. Uh, what else should I get? <laughs> I don't know. What do you want to get? You know, wow. so, so me, I mean, you get all different scales of people. Give me, give me three things. For people that genuinely don't want to piss off a tattoo artist, right? When I go in, I get a couple tattoos, but like I had one guy who was a little rough around the edges, so I didn't want to like get him pissed off, right? Then I had another guy who was just quiet, but I had, I had like a pretty pretty big piece, right? So I'm sitting there for a couple hours, 
and I don't know what to say. So if you could give people advice over there that have anxiety about pissing off their tattoo artist, what would it be? Well, one, definitely don't bargain. Don't it, what? It, don't bargain. Okay. Right? Like, uh, you know, like try and talk them down on the price where like you're just, you're setting a bad precedence. You're, you're not fucking buying a car. You're asking somebody to, you know, put all their energy into creating something for you. And you've already put them in a bad mindset. If you're trying to bargain with them over the price, I mean, you, you might talk with them and be like, Hey man, you know, this is all I have to spend on it. So if you have a constructive conversation, you know, most artists are, are, pretty open to that but if you start out with uh like hey man well i can get this for this price it's like yeah just go away i don't want to deal with you mm -hmm. so definitely don't bargain the other one is you have to listen to your artist it's not like your artist will tell you 100 and you have no input whatsoever but you have to listen to them usually they've been tattooing a decent amount of time so like i remember there was one girl that came in years and years ago and she wanted a tattoo and I, she wanted a tattoo much smaller and she wanted a difficult area to tattoo. And I said, well, Hey, that's not going to work. You know, that small over time is going to look like a blob. So we have to either simplify it or we have to make it larger. So what would you like to do? She goes, I want that tattoo that size right now. I was like, all right, well, I'm not going to do it. Wow. <laughs> so listen to your artist, you know, mm -hmm. If they're reasonable, they should give you a little bit of feedback. They shouldn't go, yeah, you got to get this. They should tell you what their opinion is, why they're thinking that, and so on. And uh, the third is you have to – this also goes with the listening to the artist a little bit, but try not to cram too much into there because people will have, like, you know, 10 different ideas they want to cram into, like, a piece as big. And you're like, that's just not going to look good. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, think, I think that's solid advice. Rob, do you have any questions? I was curious, um, you know, like what's the longest tattoo, you know, like, you know, uh, that, that actually is a good question. Yeah. Um, so over time, your skin gets irritated. And when your skin gets irritated, you start to like, you know, tense up a little bit. When you tense up a little bit, you're actually doing more damage to the skin when you keep tattooing. And the more damage the skin is, the longer it takes to heal. The longer a tattoo takes to heal, the less ink it keeps in the skin. So I find that anywhere between six to eight hours is, you know, the, the longest you want. Like most people do four hours. They do four hour sessions. Um, some people stretch out to eight hours, especially if they travel ways to see you. But if people want these long sessions, you know, you're risking one of two things, either not healing great or it not lasting nearly as long. Like, you know, the way that some people handle it, like some artists are really good. They'll do like 10 hour, you know, sessions on a person. And you're like, wow, that looks amazing. Yeah. But they go really, really shallow, you know, so they don't irritate the skin too much. So it heals up great. But if they go really shallow, it also didn't have it as long of a lifetime. And you want tattoos that still look good like five years later. Cool. Yeah. Wow. I don't know if have you ever tattooed somebody and like they they really wanted a tattoo, they seemed gung ho. And then the second they got the needle, they were like, fuck this. I don't want this. this oh, plenty. They, that's happened yeah. a lot. Oh, yeah. Okay. Does that piss you off? It does, although it happens a lot less now because people pretty much like after a while, people kind of know what they're in for. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if they contact me, they don't want a name on them or like an astrology symbol. They, they want like a sleeve or a back piece or a fairly large piece. And they've seen my work. They probably talk to other people. I get a lot of tattoo collectors, you know, like people who get tattoos by different artists and stuff. And it, it works out that way. They, you know, they tend to know more what they're in for. I remember back in the day, when I was working at flash shops, you'd get people that would come in and they're like, Oh wow, this really hurts. And like, like I had one guy, they kept going to the bathroom and rubbing Coke into his tattoo and they coming out, nice. which, which I guess numbs it up, but it means it heals horribly. 
you know, I had another guy that like he had like a coffee cup and he kept going to the bathroom and pouring like scotch or whiskey, something, you know, some hard alcohol in there is drinking it. And after a little while, I was like, dude, I'm not an idiot. I know what you're fucking doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, you, you get you get stuff like that and that that's irritating, but it happens more earlier in your tattoo career. What do I tip a guy? That did a good job. What's a good way? What's a good way to show appreciation? Well, people said that you should tip like restaurants. So 20%. I find that to be a little bit excessive because if you tip like, you know, like when I go to a restaurant, I tip 20%. Right. So if I tip 20% on a thousand dollar tattoo, that's $200, you know? So I've had people actually like I had one guy that made a ton of money I tattooed him and he gave me, I think like an $800 tip. I was like, well, man, this is, this is too much. You know? So I gave him some of it back. He's like, no, no, man, I really love it. You know, I was like, yeah, get another tattoo for me, spit it on that. So I, I think, I mean, obviously it depends on the size of the tattoo. It depends on how difficult it was. You know, you want to, you want to tip good. Don't, don't tip them like change or like, you know, a dollar or two. But you don't need to tip on a thousand dollars. So, like, if I get all right, so this one right here, right? Just a standard, like it's Roman numerals, you know. Okay. Number one, how much would you charge for that? Well, all right. Let, when did you get that? Um, in Nashua, at a tattoo, Nashua, New Hampshire. Okay, but but when? What year? Um, two like almost two years ago, and the ink's kind of getting crabby. I don't know if you can see it, but <laughs> it's kind of fading a little bit. I don't know. I I can't. Like the image isn't sharp enough. I, I will oh, say flex. this. Maybe like, I'll make it a little bigger. All right, here we go. <laughs> All right. See, I will much say this: now. when you get tattooed, it doesn't stay on the surface. Like when you first get tattooed, it looks nice and dark and fresh, but a layer of skin, you know, dies and it grows back clear over top of that. So you're seeing it underneath the layer of skin. And if that top layer of skin gets a little bit ashy or whatever, it kind of distorts the image underneath there. So there is that. Um, it's, it's hard for me to, you know, judge it without seeing it like nice and sharp in person. But uh, what did you pay for that? Hundred bucks. Wow, that's pretty cheap. <laughs> well, I walked right in. The guy's good. I saw his stuff on Instagram. Right. Okay. Um, pretty good. I go in there because I wanted a, a consultation. Right. So right. I go in there. Now he's all pissed off about a consultation. He's like, "You want to know what a consultation is? This is a fucking con- consultation. Where do you want your tattoo?" And I'm like, I don't know, somewhere over here. He's like, what do you want? I'm like, Roman rules on my kids. He's like, there's your fucking console. Uh, I wouldn't have gotten tattooed by a guy who's already pissed off. No, nah, he was <laughs> angry, dude. But like, wow. kind of yeah. cool, because I think you guys are all cool, right? So, uh, well, you know, thank you. I'm just doing my We're thing. Not, but thank you. Yeah, I will. <laughs> listen, it's a badass. Pl- tat- tattoos are just badass, you know. Um, 100 bucks. What do I tip a guy? On something like this, you do you do this tattoo? Let's say you charge me. I mean, if it was a hundred dollars for the tattoo, I think twenty bucks would be fair. But if it was like say a thousand dollar tattoo, I would say like you know maybe fifty bucks would be fair. Really? Yeah. See, I'm thinking a little more generous. All right, but so even well, something like there that is no problem with thinking generous, right? And usually, people who tip me more, I charge I charge by the hour, so it took me less time to do it. Like you're just like, Hey, he's a nice guy. You know, Oh, let's say this, you know, gotcha. so it, it all works out. Like when you tip people, well, it works out for sure. For sure. Rob, any other questions? I don't know. I, <clears throat> well, I was curious. We kind of like broached it just a little bit, but like being kind of like full tatted and stuff, like when you go into like a Starbucks or something like that, you know what I mean? Do people, treat you differently to like you know looks and stuff is that like what's that like if they do well they, they probably do i mean the thing is one i live in new york city so yeah. if you live in new york city you know people are a lot more open to however you look like when i go down south i don't even realize how tattooed i am until i start getting all these people looking at me like i'm fucking crazy mm-hmm. you know <laughs> and then i'm like first i'm like what are they staring at i'm like oh yeah that's right you know my head's tattooed yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do people ask you all the time, like, "Oh, did that hurt?" Yeah. Did that uh, hurt right there? Did that hurt. Yeah. Well, and you get stupid people. They're like, "Hey, man, did you do all that yourself?" 
And if they're that stupid, I just roll with it. So I'm like, I'm like, yeah, man, it was really difficult. I broke out like, you know, mirrors and magnifying glasses. And, and you know, and they keep going. They're like, wow, how do you do that? So I just keep going with it wow. until they realize I'm taking the piss out of them. And then finally they, they get kind of grumpy. But it's like, why did you ask me such a fucking stupid question in the first place? Totally. Is it you have you ever um tattooed any part of yourself like as an ex- and you yeah, just I, I, tattooed, else? I tattooed most of my arm um probably like 21 years ago you just sitting there going like how do you have your hand positioned like doesn't that hurt well it does hurt but i mean you know you kind of like you're so concentrated on it that you kind of you know don't think about that as much and the skin has to be spread so i'd have like my girlfriend spreading the skin and what my girlfriend at the time, then she'd be like, you know, getting bored of it and like letting go. And I'd be, <laughs> Hey, what are you doing? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I want, how do I get, you know, like when you first get a tattoo, like I mentioned before, I got like a, a chest piece. Right. And when right. I first got it, it was like inflamed and it was all the, all the red on there and stuff like that. Right. It looked so <laughs> badass. Yeah. <laughs> how do I make it look like that forever? Just going to uh, get some red in there. Probably, probably get Sunburn. tattooed again. Yeah, you're, looks, you're not going to get that. Yeah, it looks sick though. You know what I'm talking about. Obviously, yeah. you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, but yeah, uh, it, it looks it looks a lot sharper and more stark yeah. because it's like you know the black is solid black and the skin is a little bit pink around it and a little bit raised and yeah. Yeah. Sorry, it's not permanent. <sighs> it's a bummer. Yeah. Damn it. Um, wait, one last thing. Uh, Rob, okay. did you hear this rumor? Maybe Rob even started. You, you listen to Tool, Dan? Yeah. Oh, Tool. I, I know like this Tool. rumor. Yeah. What am I going to ask, Rob? What am I going to ask? I'm going to ask if Maynard James Keenan has a holographic tattoo. Is that even a thing? Is that even real? I don't know if he does. I, I actually have not heard that, but most of the tattoos that, that, most of the tattoos that do something more than what you would think a tattoo would do are it's either fake or it comes with all sorts of complications. Like uh, people would get, um, what is it called? Like the, the CR code, you know, where yeah. you can, like scan uh, it. Yeah. People would get tattoos of that. So yes, you can scan that. Yes, that will come up. But over time, all tattoos start to spread out a little bit. So once it starts to spread out, it's going to be unreadable. So you're just going to have garbage <laughs> tattooed on you. Yeah, totally. Just a square yeah. with a bunch of yeah. dots. And then I know that um, the glow in the dark ink, like a couple different companies have come out with that, but it always causes skin cancer. Like I knew a guy that, you know, had a, like a sick of it all dragon tattooed on his neck and it had skin cancer and like these big boils would be breaking out of his arms. And he'd go to pierce and get them cut out. Like oh, the guy, the guy was a little bit off the hinges. I mean, we called him Mad Dog. That was his his tattoo name. Was yeah, Mad he's Dog. the that arc tattoo. Of course, his yeah. name is Mad Dog. That's <laughs> <laughs> was like, That's do awesome. you want the same thing that makes your watches glow in the dark tattooed in your skin? Yeah, no. Good. So, is there such thing as a holographic tattoo? Like, is that even not not that I've heard of? Yeah. Like right. I said, most everything that's a gimmick. It doesn't last very long. It comes with all sorts of complications. So most people, they get tattoos that look like tattoos. They're kind of regular tattoos. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Gotcha. Thank you for debunking that. Um, yeah, Rob, we, heard, we had that rumor when we were like 13. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> that's been going on. So, well, sir, I thank you very much. Do you want to give a shout out to anything that you like? What, what are you up to now? If people wanted to check you out, where could they find you? You can check me out on my website. It's uh, danhink.com. It's D-N-H-E-N-K.com. And definitely buy my latest book. I'm super excited about it. A lot of people seem to like it. So maybe that is good for it. Maybe it's just because I tattooed them. They like the tattoo and don't want to tell me the truth. I don't know. <laughs> nice. But, uh, you can check out all my stuff on my website. Awesome. Cool. Your stuff is amazing. Thank you. Uh, uh, Rob, I don't know if you get a chance to check it out on the website there, but... I mean, just do a Google search of this guy. It's uh, there's some serious, serious stuff there. So it's pretty cool. Um, I feel like we've only touched a little bit on everything. You're a fascinating guy for sure. So yeah, I thank you. 
I thank you so up. much for being on the show um, and telling us your story. And I'm sure there's way, way, way more. Um, but yeah, you definitely did awesome. So thank you very much. Yes, yeah, so be sure to check him out. And folks, a little promo for us now. If you go to www.grillyourassoff.com, you like grilling, don't you, Dan? Yes. Yes. If you like grilling, did you know you can go to this website, www.grillyourassoff.com. You can get all of your grilling essentials. You know, you want some seasonings. You need a new flipper thingy, you know, all that kind <laughs> of stuff. Flipper thingy. Yeah, you know, the flipper thingy. You know yeah. exactly. Go ahead. Go in there. Search like bar. a spatula? There you go. Well, <laughs> you know, whatever. You know, you're from what you're, where do you live right now? Right now, I live in Long Beach, New York. That's yeah, where my shop is. I live in I live in uh, Massachusetts. We call it a flipper, a flipper thing over here. So, uh, <laughs> no, we don't. Yeah, I call it a spatula. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, a, a spatula. Well, Rob's one of those big city guys. You know, we yeah. got New York and 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 Boston. No, not when I'm from. We call it a flipper thing. But anyways, if you go there, you want some new, you want some new gear. If you go to www.grillyourassoff.com, <laughs> grillyourassoff.com, you go and you make a purchase at checkout. You can go to the promo code and you type in Reality Tonic. You can get yourself 15% off. Okay. Sounds good. So, so, Dan, do I have your word that you will go on www.grillyourassoff.com? You don't have my word. <laughs> All right. I probably He'll will. think about it. He'll, He'll think about it. it. He'll yeah. Consider it. All right, folks, thank you very much, and uh, we're signing off. Rob, any last words? Uh, no. All right, see ya. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Wake up to reality, to reality, to reality.